So obviously it all depends on what the spot price does. But if I just look at the uranium to gold ratio, for example, I think I've done a calculation. This is just a rough figure. I haven't done the latest one, but I think um, it came to around three hundred dollars to four hundred three three hundred to five hundred dollars per pound. Uh, was the was the spot price that I got if I just used the uranium to gold ratio, something like that. Wow. <clears throat> now, if I used um, oil to Dow Jones ratio, so what's interesting about oil to uranium ratio, first of all, is in the 1970s, for example, it met around one to one, so $40 per barrel of oil. Um, within that commodity cycle, not at the same time, but within that commodity 1970s commodity cycle, uranium went to around $40 per pound, in, uh, $40 per pound and oil also went to $40 per pound uh, for, per barrel of oil. <laughs> so it met one to one, the ratio. And what's interesting is if we were to repeat the ratios from 1970s, Dow Jones to oil ratio and therefore Dow Jones to uranium ratio, we go over $1,000 per pound for uranium. And that might seem crazy to you right now. And, you know, even if I, even when I talk about it, I think, yeah, that would be unbelievable. But if you just consider the fact that we've got so many market conditions that are right for commodities right now. So if you look at the 2000s running commodities, and if you look at uranium in particular, our supply deficit was pretty much nothing compared to what we've seen right now. And we had lots of secondary supplies available from World War II, all the, all the uranium inventories that were built up from them that were available in the secondary markets that we don't have right now as well, because we've had prolonged period of supply and deficit in the uranium market. So if you actually marry those factors together and go, actually, if it was just to hit the uranium prices that we saw back in the 1970s when we had the energy crisis, as we are seeing right now, <laughs> we're seeing energy crises across the board. We've got coal prices skyrocketing. We've got oil prices skyrocketing. We've got natural gas prices skyrocketing. Well, actually, uranium, given the development in the uranium sector, even more so than the 1970s, because what you've got to remember back in the 1970s was a relatively new technology. It wasn't used as much. Right now, we've got like the China building um, all the nuclear reactors. We've got Korea um, building and, and also restarting a couple of new, uh, nuclear reactors. We've got Japan restarting nuclear reactors. So we've got everywhere in the world trying to build this whole nuclear uh, fleet of nuclear reactors. And we've got a huge supply deficit we haven't seen before which makes me believe this time around the uranium is going to run a lot harder than the 2000s run. Let's, and from that perspective, even if you just in, uh, adjust the two, uh, sorry, adjust the 2000s runs uranium price. Uh, and if you just, um, you know, put, put the inflation factor there, you know, you, you get well over $200 per pound, right? So um, to say that we're going to see something that's over $500 per, per pound, when we've got a huge shortage of energy everywhere, and power outages everywhere. Uh, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I, I'm hoping we're going to get to that risk reward on the on the different uh, different assets that you could be speculating on here. But um, I, I also wanted to ask. Hmm, no, maybe we're going to move on from it. I was just going to ask how long how long do you think how long before you consider this a success or you consider it a failure? Like, let's say we wake up in 10 years from now, we're repeating the same thesis, but uranium hasn't ran above $50. Are you considering it a failure then? Or, you, or do you still think that? that would be a failure. Like, yeah. Okay. So 10 years is too much. What, what is the right time? Oh. I, I mean, it really, really depends, right? So I think, um, I will need to look at the market conditions, but basically what, what the reason I think it's going to be within the next five years is because the market conditions are probably going to be right for the next five years. Um, just because of the debt cycle, because of the, uh, the, the money supply and what they're doing. So typically when the Fed starts tightening like this, it takes around two to four years typically uh, for the markets to collapse and there to be a deflationary pressure. So I'm expecting the commodity cycle especially the uranium, to play out before that happens. And so if it doesn't happen before the next defl deflationary cycle, then I would be, one, uh, first of all, surprised, uh, very disappointed, but I would almost call this investment this is a failure uh, mm. for, for, for that period. It doesn't necessarily mean if the fundamentals for uranium stays really strong in terms of the supply deficit, supply demand picture, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to sell out of this trade 
But I do expect this trade to play out within the next five years. Okay, so that's sort of where you're you're targeting a, like your perfect exiting strategy would involve you being completely out of uranium in the next five years, or how do you see it? Yes, I'll be completely out of uranium in the next five years. Hopefully, if it plays out according to my plan. Nice, nice. Are you are you are you on on the train where people are saying like, well, I'd be scaling out in different tranches, or how do how do you plan on exiting? Yes, I'll be scaling out. So typically, mm. as I showed you earlier, um, the bigger miners. So I I do hold some bigger miners, um, and so those are the ones that I'll be scaling out first because I know the institutional money will start taking profits in those names um, sooner and the smaller names. Um, and that will be my scaling out approach rather than selling stuff in tranches. I mean, obviously I'm going to do that for individual stocks as well, but my biggest scale out approach will be to start uh, start selling the producers first and then the developers and then the explorers. And that will be my main way of um, approaching, I guess, the scaling out. Okay. Is there something in between that worries you? I mean, I've been... I've been out there looking for bear theses. I even recently spoke to a guy from Twitter, Chapman. Um, he told me about a laser. Sounds like something out of a movie, but he told me about a laser enrichment laser technology. Enrichment. Right. And, um, silence. Right, exactly. Silence. And how that could add to the supply of the markets. I failed to be sold on any of the bear theses. Like I, I don't see that as something that destroys the market. A nuclear accident obviously is like the worst thing that could happen. I think that we, we'd have more worries than just that then or, 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 or something else like a bigger war or whatever. But is there something else that worries you in between? Like maybe the Fed doesn't tighten enough or something else that worries you in between? Not really. <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm looking at all the market conditions and also the liquid in the system. So for, for there to be a proper commodities bull cycle, what you need to see is huge liquidity in the system, which we have right now. We've got unprecedented level of cash sitting with the institutional banks and also um, your household. So we've never seen, <clears throat> I'll just show, quickly show you and share that with you. And this, this, is, this is what people are missing when they're talking about the savings rate going down. They're missing the bigger picture, which is we've had huge liquid injection from the Fed through QE um, as a, as a, in response to, to, the, to the medical event. Um, so... I'll just quickly show you this. <clears throat> and I will just show you the extent to which these banks are flooded with liquidity right now. So JP Morgan's balance sheet of 2007. And obviously, we, kn we know that there was a financial crisis in 2008. Well, why did we have financial crisis? Because there was not enough liquidity in the, in the banking system. So if you see it's JP Morgan's balance sheet in 2007, for example, Deposit with the banks, this is a cash amount, and the deposit with the banks are effectively cash as well, cash sitting with the Fed mainly. And you've got about $50 million, right? Out of their total asset of $1.5 they've got $50 million in cash, which is nothing if you think about it. But look at how much cash they've got now. <laughs> they've got $26 million in cash and deposit with the banks, mainly with the Fed, 714 million out of their 3.7 billion dollars in net uh, in total assets. That's a huge increase. That's a huge increase. And if you actually look at the 2021, and this is not my word, this is basically what's in JP Morgan's uh, in annual report in 2021 annual report. What they said here here was these assets are cash and other highly marketable securities. This is an extraordinary amount of liquidity. <laughs> They use the word extraordinary amount of liquidity. And also in relation to the consumer's deposits. So if you look at the JP Morgan deposit as well here, um, liabilities, deposits, <laughs> $2.4 billion in deposits, which is reflective of how much their clients are depositing with JP Morgan. <laughs> it says this is an extraordinary amount of consumer and wholesale deposits. This is how much cash people have sit in the bank's and also the wholesale, uh, uh, wholesale um, customers and also the, the individual consumers have on the sideline. This is liquidity just waiting to come into the system. And so, sorry, I'm just trying to show you this household deposit as well. So if you look at this, households and non-profit organizations, checkable deposit and currency asset level. 
So back in 2008, the way in which this happens, the financial crisis happens and the liquidity events are, uh, are driven is basically people run out of money in their deposit accounts. It makes sense, right? So savings rate dwindles. First of all, that's the first sign. And then, so which is the first sign that we're starting, maybe, maybe starting to see right now. And then the second step is that as the savings rate goes down, well, obviously your checkable deposits and currency, how much money you've got sitting in your bank account starts going down, dwindling down to nothing in 2007. Well, if you're believing in the liquidity event happening right now, you're believing in this unprecedented level of cash just dwindling down to nothing while, I'll show you this, while you've got <clears throat> record low. So this is household debt service payment as a, percent, uh, as a percentage of disposable personal income. So you're expecting, if you're expecting a liquidity event now, you're expecting a household to use up their unprecedented level of cash while paying record low level of household debt service payments as a percentage of their disposable income. Hmm. It doesn't make sense. Well, the only, the only thing that's possible for me is that eventually all the cash that are held on the sideline has to come flowing into the commodity sector. That's the only thing that, and, and, and why? Because the fundamentals are so strong. So if you look at the various markets, and this is what I had posted up earlier, but <clears throat> commodities, commodities is the only place to be right now. With stocks, you've got historically over, it, stocks are historically overvalued. The valuations are becoming more and attractive with rising rates, because if you think about the, the discounted cash flow model or the net present value uh, calculations model, then you're effectively with the high interest rates, you're discounting your future cash flows and future income at a higher rate, which means the present value of those future cash flows and income becomes less. So the valuations of stocks naturally drops with rising rates. With bonds, for example, um, the biggest holder, Fed, is telling everyone that they will be net sellers of bonds through the QT program that they've just announced. So what are the bondholders going to do? They're going to try and front run the Fed. They're not going to be support. They're not going to be buying up bonds anymore because they know the bond prices will go down if you don't you, if you don't have the most supportive buyer in the room. Mm. With crypto, <laughs> I just said, who wants fake stuff when you're running out of real stuff? And cash is another guaranteed way to lose money through inflation. Inflation sitting well above eight percent right now. Your PPI came hotter than ten percent. So who wants to hold cash when you're guaranteed to lose purchasing power? by having it just sitting in your bank account. Real estate becomes less attractive because the cost of borrowing goes up. Um, but I think it really depends on what you talk about in terms of supply and demand. So with commodities, this is the only place to be. And as, as I said, I think that big institutional money is positioning the, themselves in bigger names, in bigger commodity names, because we've got energy crisis, We've got huge supply deficit that can't be met for years due to the mining cycle. So, so the beautiful thing about this mining cycle is we have had such abundance of commodities um, following the 2000s run. So following 2000 to 2008 run, all the mining, all, all the mine, a lot of the mines went into production uh, because the commodities prices skyrocketed. And for almost you know, five, to, five years to a decade out, it kept continued to produce. Because you can't just shut down these mines. Once you start producing, you can't suddenly shut these mines just because the commodity prices are falling, which means we've had abundance of commodity supply. But now, because we've had low commodity prices for the last decade, well, there's no production of commodities. And you're seeing that in the uranium market right now. There's, you, no one's producing. <laughs> um, so you've got the mining cycles lining up. Uh, you've got the lack of production capacity to meet demand. And you, as you know, Come up with commodities, it takes years for mines to come into production, especially uranium. It takes, you know, some say I think it takes five years to bring like, you know, a developer into production. So it takes a long time. You've got currencies around the world. So if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about the 1970s, um, it wasn't a global phenomenon. It, it, it was the, the inflation was mainly found in the UK and the US, and it wasn't a global phenomenon. But right now, You've got currencies that are being printed everywhere, uh, whether it be the Chinese yuan, whether it be the Korean won, the Japanese yen, whatever it might be. There's vast supply of currencies in the world that eventually need to uh, chase hard assets as they see inflation, pressure, inflation pressures across everywhere. <laughs> and um, 
you've got you've got the QT and the rate hiking that are forcing rotation. Once again, if you go back to the 1970s epic commodity super cycle, we've had rapidly rising interest rates um, to fight off inflation. And so what happens then is because you're basically saying bond prices are falling, interest rate rise means stocks are falling, uh, stock price valuation of stocks are going down. Well, they need to find another spot to go into and they can only be commodities. So you've got multiple factors um, that are lining up for this commodity cycle that we haven't seen in the 2000s. We just simply didn't. <laughs> so um, I think I'm more bullish in commodities than ever. And I think I really believe that this, this could even be bigger than 1970s run. I also, you mentioned something that made me want to ask you this, by the way, because I wanted to ask you about uh, what you think drives the uranium market specifically, because I saw a conversation between you and uh, Umesh Gandhi on uh, Twitter. He, he's got some funny comments sometimes, by the way, I've seen him before, so shout out to him. But so he, <laughs> I guess he asked you what you think on why uranium is not outperforming oil or natural gas, like we have the energy commodities running, uranium is not. And so you said that it's a much smaller market that does a lot of nothing and then moves all of a sudden, just as you said, like one day it breaks out. So trying to time it might be fool's errand. So that's when, I guess that happens when more people are in the line, lining up to, to you know, bidding up the price. Yeah. Uh, what do you think though will attract those people out of other sectors? Because you talk about, and I, I hope we're going to talk about that, that money rotation and, and money flows later on, but you know, what do you think that is going to take people, say, from oil or from natural gas, make them interested in, in uranium so that uranium can start outperforming those? Or how, like what, maybe two questions. Oh, this is confusing. Maybe two questions. Where, where are people going to come from, you think? And what do you think is going to attract them to uranium specifically if they're already natural gas and oil? Yeah, so I think the biggest fund flow will come from the institutional investors. So <clears throat> with institutional investors, they've got minimum liquidity, uh, liquidity um, requirements just based, mm -hmm. in, you know, based on the daily trading volume of you know, the instruments that we're talking about. So in this case, it could be spots. So as soon as the liquidity requirements are met, and obviously spots building up in volume, every time there's a spike, you know, the volume builds up and it's becoming a more liquid vehicle. So when the spot has enough volume, um, and institutional investors can finally participate based on their investment policies. So these institutional investors are governed by the, in, uh, by the investment policies. So they have to meet certain requirements in order to buy a product. And one of the key requirements for most institutional investors are liquidity, right? So it needs to provide them with li enough liquidity. So, you know, when, they are for, when, they are, when it comes to selling into the market, they're not left selling, dumping into a market that doesn't provide them with enough liquidity or trading volume. Mm. So <clears throat> once those funds can start flowing in based on the liquidity requirements, I think it will be all the institutional investors who are ESG conscious, who wants to have exposure in the energy sector, just piling in and trying to front run each other. And so that's where I think nothing's happening right now until the price action and the liquidity. So once there's price action, so whoever participates first will drive the price action, that will drive liquidity, that will encourage more institutional investors to, uh, to participate, that will draw retail investors. And I think, it, it, and that's why I think it will be a case of very quiet for the time being and all at once and all of a sudden, it's just gonna pick up. Okay, and, and do you think that it's the fundamentals that are gonna attract people? specifically into the sector or will fundamentals stop mattering after a certain a certain point because you, you talk about some of the you know some of these assets i guess you can call that assets digital assets coins or stuff like that is that they don't really have much of a fundamental as far as i understand i probably don't understand it well enough to speak out so but but people still attracted and even people that like me, don't understand it. They're still attracted. They are just attracted to the to the gains, not really to the fundamentals. So, do you think that we need a big move in uranium first, or do you think that those people start coming in simply because they're going to start realizing the fundamentals? I mean, the I mean, if you look at any bull market, the the piling of the retail comes towards the end of the bull market. So, I don't expect anything different this time around because mm -hmm. retail is mainly um, retail investors are mainly interested in. The momentum. So I think it will be the institutional investors first, and then they will position themselves, and it will they will be liquidity um, that picks up, 
uh, obviously the price will pick up with it. And I think the retail investors will pile in later. Right. You told me that. You and obviously the fundamentals it. support it. And, right. and regardless of, of the price, you know, people are just going to, and, and at the end of the bull market, what traditionally happens is, you know, regardless of what the price is, you know, people are still looking at the fundamentals when you shouldn't be looking at the fundamentals towards the end of the commodity cycle. Mm. Because mm. what happens at the, at the end of the commodity cycle, you can still have a very um, bad supply deficit. But once the price runs hard enough, the institutional money starts pulling out. They start taking profit and that drives the prices lower. So what, what I'm trying to say is towards the end of the bull market, what you will hear is the retail, retail investor potentially touting about how good the fundamentals for the uranium sector is, while the institutional investors might at the same time be pulling out all their gains. But and it sounds to that. me like that's happening right now. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it sounds to me like that's happening right now, which seems totally crazy because if I open up my Twitter account, Everybody's bull. I'm obviously in an echo chamber because I, you know, I, I, I'm super bullish in arena myself, and that's who I involved with. But so the retail, everybody's, you know, shouting it's going to go to the moon. And then at the same time, I have the bear traps report, which is an institutional newsletter going out and saying, you know, let's, you know, we're we're taking out a third of our position of uranium. So it's sort of I'm kind of getting scared as to what you're saying here. Is that because it seems like that might be happening right now? No, but it wouldn't make sense to so, be so happening the market right now. Conditions the market conditions and historical valuations, valuations matter. So if you okay. look at the valuations of the companies right now compared to the 2000s run, and don't forget that we've got much stronger fundamentals right now compared to 2000s, and I expect the prices to go higher. I expect the valuations to go higher this time around versus mm -hmm. 2000s, given the fundamentals are a lot stronger, right? Um, mm -hmm. We are very much, <laughs> if you want to call it that, you are very much undervalued compared to the 2000s. So if you look at the valuations of the companies right now, it's very much below the valuations that we saw in 2000s. And if we just take a look at Bannerman, for example, Bannerman was trading at $500 million market cap in 2008, just um, at, at its peak, with 27 million pounds in the ground. Right? Mm -hmm. Trading at 20, approximately $20 per pound in the ground. Bannerman right now is trading at around $270 million market cap has 270 million pounds in the ground and is trading at $1 per pound in the ground. Hmm. So that's just an example. If you look at Chemico, for example, and I showed you this chart. If you look at this chart and say, let's say compared to the Dow Jones, Chemico, I use Chemico because it hasn't been diluted and I expect Chemico to go a bit higher this time around because we we're talking about Chemico, which had quite a lot of, um, I guess, the, the contracts that were fixed at very low prices, which limited, I think, its upside. But I think it's going to go higher relative to D Dow Jones Industrial Leverage this time around. So when we're talking about, I guess, the valuation of Chemico compared to D uh, Dow Jones Industrial Leverage, at these ridiculous low valuations compared to Dow Jones, I don't think you can call that a market top. Hmm. So there are various factors. I mean, even if you just look at, I guess, a, a typical sign for a commodity, I guess, a blow-off top is where uh, the cost of production has to be a lot, lot lower than the actual price of the commodity itself. Right now, we're trading, as you know, we're trading much below the cost of production and, and you can't bring on any new mines into production at these current spot prices, so at all, all time prices. Hmm. Um, so it, it's, we are far from even getting just started here uh, hmm. with uranium. And that's the big differentiator. I know when, when you hear about institutional money pulling out and trading here and there, maybe they're traders. You, you don't know that. Mm. But you will see the positioning, and I'm seeing the positioning in Chemico Corporation. So when you see Chemico Corporation, for example, putting in higher lows and higher highs, um, and I'll just share with you the chart. A sign of a very strong bull market is when you see on a weekly time frame or a monthly time frame, it putting in just consistently higher lows all the way throughout, higher lows, higher lows, higher, higher lows. And this is, even if we do see a pullback to here, let's say we see a pullback down to, you know, the neckline of the breakout area here, you could call that one big low um, and then a higher low for a much bigger move. So, and I'll just zoom out to show you. What I mean is, if you look at this chart, for example, this was, this was one big low, higher low, and then you put in another high low and then you launch. 
So I don't know if we're going to do this and then launch or if, we, if this is just a big move up. But unless, <laughs> the, the, I mean, Chemico is basically telling us because Chemico, when you talk about institution money positioning themselves as well, they usually start piling into these bigger names first. And you're mm. seeing that in Chemico because it's showing so much strength. And, and another way to tell this is if you look at Chemico, for example, divided by <clears throat> DML, then it's Mines Corporation. What, you, what you'll see at the beginning of the bull market is that they, so, so this is 2000, right? 2005, this was the bulk of the run. What you see, and this was the mid run. I'll just overlay this with um, Chemico chart down at the bottom so it's just clear. At the start of any bull run, the big caps like Chemico outperforms smaller caps or mid caps because if you look at the relative performance of Chemico, it's gone up, 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 up against DML. So this is CCJ divided by Denison Mines up until this point. Now, Denison Mines performed towards the end of the bull run. I'll just overlay this with U.UN chart as well. So U.UN picked here. And this is the relative outperformance of um, D DML. So as you see the ratio come down, this is relative outperformance of DML. So Denison Mines compared to Chemico. What it's doing, what it's basically telling you here is institutional money. So you're seeing out, uh, relative outperformance of Chemico against Denison Mines here as well. What it's telling you is that the smart institutional money is looking for liquidity and going is positioning themselves in Chemical Corporation against let's say the mid caps and the smaller miners. And that's, that's where you see that relative outperformance of chemical corporation. As we mature in the bull market, you'll see a bunch of smaller caps do a huge catch up. So that's retail inv investors piling in. And what happens towards the end of the bull run is chemical corporations, for example, so, so institutional money starts selling into rising spot prices. And you see this action everywhere in gold stocks, silver stocks, you name it, every single stock out there for any commodity. So this is telling me that relative outperformance of CCJ is right now telling me that we're still in a bull, uh, we're still young in the bull market mm. as institutional money is position positioning themselves. And we haven't really seen proper retail participation yet. Yeah, I like having my biases confirmed. So thank you for that. Uh, you, again, <laughs> We have a lot of time to go in this bull run. I was just noting some stuff down. If I'm looking at the price chart of uranium, though, um, because you know you mentioned that you mentioned that in here as well, that like you're comparing it to the previous cycle, but it looks like this ride is already much more volatile than the previous cycle. Like last time was sort of like you know beaten down, beaten down, and all of a sudden it it, it exploded, but now it, it seemed. Maybe it just feels to me because I, I wasn't around uh, during the the previous bull cycle in uranium, but right now it feels to me that this one is like that we're going more up and down, more up and down, more aggressively than during the last bull run. W what does that tell you? The fact that there's more volatility right now. What does what does that tell you? I think there was a lot of volatility in the last cycle as well. So if you actually do a measured move of the Denison Mines chart, you will see multiple fifty percent pullbacks along the way. Mm. Um, I think with this one, I think you're right in the sense that this time around, it has been a little bit more volatile um, and we are seeing a little bit more violent moves if you just do a measured move on, on chemical corporations as well. So if you just look at the chemical corporations chart, the last cycle, <clears throat> let me just show you. I was also mostly talking about the, the, the price of uranium itself. So price not so much that. Yeah. So not so much the... Unfortunately, we can't... <laughs> Yeah, like this. So we, we're not here yet within the uranium cycle. That's the only thing. So we, we can't really go back any further unless you, get, you look at UX, the futures chart, which mm. looks very messy like that. So, <clears throat> but I, I, I must admit that a lot of the stocks are being more volatile than last time around. Um, a lot of them are. And, and I think it's partly due to spot, uh, mm. spot, and it's because I think, I think it created such a huge move when it first started um, that it needs 
we, we just need to spend a bit more time consolidating. So usually what happens with the, with, if you're just looking at the charts technically, from a technical perspective, what usually happens after a massive move up, like we've seen, you know, when Spot first entered the market, was it last, when was it? Was it last August? <clears throat> when we oh, yeah. had that huge run up last yeah. August or something like that, um, we had a huge spike. And so we had a lot of profit sellers, uh, profit takers um, into that. And usually what happens is when you've had a massive move up, just technically speaking, just charting wise, you typically need to consolidate for longer. Um, and that can mm. feel a little bit more volatile, a little bit more violent, a little bit more frustrating. Um, Hold up. Can, so, you, can you repeat that again? So if you have um, more spike your move, you need to consolidate for longer. Is that Okay. Yeah, well, basically, basically what happens with chart and the way that I think about it is usually it's a runner, right? So when you run uphill and when you've jumped, when you went on a huge sprint, you usually need to take a bit of a rest, uh, a bit longer rest, and you need more time to recover because you've exerted so much energy within such a short period of time. Um, so I feel like that's what uranium is doing. So otherwise, what it could have done is go along for a jog. Nice steady up, nice steady rise, which means which could have meant that we don't spend too much time, you know, going sideways for a long time. Mm. It doesn't need to rest as much. So usually with charts, I just think of it like that. It could, you could think of it as like a runner. You could think of it as like a Formula One car, um, and and taking a pit stop after a hard run or going for a tire change if you're driving too hard. So um, that's just typically how charts work.